Welcome to Renewables Unscripted, a show where we have the chance to talk about entrepreneurs shaping and moving the renewable energy industry in the entire world. Uh, James, who are we welcoming today? Today, we've got Will Hitchcock from Above Surveying. Um, now above, they are a global player in the drone thermographics and data analytics space. They've done some really cool stuff, delivering products to clients all over the globe. Welcome, Will. Welcome uh, to uh, Renewable Inscripted. Will, thank you so much. It, it's amazing that you're here. Uh, we've crossed paths a number of times over the past, I want to say, almost decade, it seems like. Uh, yeah. Or maybe time together just feels longer. Um, <laughs> so what? just for our viewers here, uh, you want to briefly give us a history of above surveying and like, or above, pardon me, in, a, in like 45 seconds, what's the elevator view of above surveying? Yes, so above is a is an aerial inspection and data analytics company focused on the utility scale solar industry. So started out life um, primarily doing aerial thermography with drones, um, but we've we've developed a whole range of other kind of aerial related service offerings in the sector, but but also a software platform that that goes beyond just aerial data. Um, so yeah, software and data and, and aerial inspections. Love it. Love it. And, and it's funny because I, I know a bit of your background as well. And you, you started way back in technology and then got into solar. How did you end up putting the most all together one day? What was, what was that trigger point that suddenly said, you know what, we're going to mash these all together that I've done my history and do some really cool stuff. Yeah. So, so I, I'm one of these classic examples of someone who spent a lot of time working in a soulless kind of corporate environment sorry ex-employer but um you know i cut i did a lot of work in technology in banking and legal um in the city in london and needed something more meaningful in my life and i kind of got into solar my background right is a far, i'm a farmer's son so i grew up on the land understanding weather and nature and and energy actually um and it's sort of all sort of coalesced into hang on a minute we need to do something about um you know decarbonizing our energy and sort of reducing our impact on the planet and that's where the whole thing started um and that led on to i put solar on my house 14 years ago solar thermal so solar pv so i've always had a bit of a penchant for solar and then my background i actually am a private pilot so there's something that's slightly odds with my environmental credentials, but I've been into flying and aviation. So it's a kind of a mashup of tech, flying things and solar. Um, and that's what culminated into, into above. But really the business opportunity became very clear while running an EPC during the UK boom um, in terms of the need for these kind of services. Yeah. So, so what was the first sale what was the first pitch was it the first pitch like hey solar i can look at things from above pun intended and yeah. give you some insights so what, what was that first value proposition that first sale and uh and how did it go so so i think the kind of like eureka moment was so we started using drones to do construction monitoring during 2014 and 15 during in the UK. Um, and this was at a time, I think the real kind of the, the catalyst was the fact that the UK boom time was the biggest solar assets being built in Europe at the time. You know, Europe, UK had bigger assets for whatever reason, the, the subsidies and, and everything around it supported bigger assets in the UK than perhaps had been built previously and certainly in mainland Europe. Um, and there was a lot of institutional money coming into the industry as a result of that. Um, and as a result of that, there was a lot more due diligence and sort of contractual kind of governance and control around these projects. So quality assurance, I think in the UK was, you, I, I would say it was probably taken to another level that had been previous, you know, previously in the industry. Um, and when I started experimenting with thermography, um, and looking at some of the assets that we had commissioned, that we had built, 
it was quite obvious there was loads of stuff that you could see that was probably quite important but wasn't being detected in any other way and that was at a time when i think most contracts had like 10 percent handheld thermography was an obligation on the O&M or the EPC contract or whatever, but it was never done and it was never possible to evidence whether it had been done or not or what was found, right? So, you know, I kind of knew we were onto something. Um, and then it was just a case of knocking on a few funds doors in London and saying, hey, you want a bit of this? Um, and they initially said, probably not. And then <laughs> gave, g- gave them a free one megawatt inspection of part of one of their assets and every single one of those doors I knocked on has been a a customer ever since because it was so obvious you know that I think that's one of the most amazing things about this is that it was so obvious that it can add value and have have commercial value but it's just about the industry maturing and getting their head around it and most of the constraints are just like not should should we pay for it it's who pays for it it's where does the budget sit who's going to take the hit on that service right so it was quite an interesting time um yeah, yeah 2016 was when i was knocking on these doors the first half of 2016 and then the first paying customer yeah i won't say who it was but they're still a customer but it was it was amazing to send out an invoice to someone for, for, for something that you had kind of cobbled so, together so I, at the time so, so i see kind of two circles like the follow the money type of view of the world like yeah. who are you targeting right i think now it's like who's paying for it but at the onset really kind of a follow the money and i think that's a interesting kind of tidbit for for anyone uh starting a business like who has who's holding the purse string who has the most to gain from from a service is a good yeah view of the the most to lose long term yeah well the most to lose is not as obvious as the most to gain from a sales perspective james if you if you're back at us selling our software for years downside mitigation is a lot less sexy than upside. Uh, and that's sometimes it's, it's this two sides of the same coin, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And you had an obligation on top of that, right? Which I love. Like if you have a market driven by, hey, you have, you obliged to do this and there's low evidence that you've done it, but it's written somewhere in a contract, then that yeah. gives you kind of the right to be, to start, right? It's like, so I yeah. think it's very smart. Like yeah, you're at, at that intersection uh, to, to get started. I think, it, yeah, it was at the um, Solar Asset Management Conference in Milan in 2016 where I was talking about this. And it was almost sort of being patted on the head by people saying, you know, nice gimmick. nice. I like drones. They're good toys. Nice idea. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, roll the clock on four years and now it's in the best practice guide in, in Europe and is commonplace throughout the world in terms of uh, – of, a, of a, a smart way of looking at the conditions of, of millions of modules in a field, right? Um, where there previously wasn't a solution. But, you know, the, the beginning of it was, um, you know, there's so much has happened in the industry since then in terms of this thing being a drone service provider has become a thing, you know, abbreviation DSP. That didn't exist four or five years ago, right? And no. the drones that can do this work weren't mainstream in fact our first drones were completely custom um with a thermal camera and a gopro on on a custom made gimbal um so you know back back then the, it, we were looking at the challenges to scaling it assuming that there wasn't kind of a drone industry that was going to act as the sort of backbone for it but thankfully that has happened right so now you can you can draw on that whole network of drone service providers without having to put your own people out in in 25 different countries so it's moved on a lot that's an interesting piece around scaling and 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 riding the trend on these things and Mm. it's interesting how how that scale sort of happens and how important it is the business to have sort of the world come up and the timing at the same time um Mm. but what are the other factors you think that came into that because you said it wasn't like it couldn't have been just aerial thermography of solar plants that drove all this drone adoption uh, is there mm-hmm. another wave you wrote in on this that you think helped build this up? Well, I th- yeah, I mean, the whole drone service provider network and the use of thermographic cameras for search and rescue and those kind of and heat loss, building heat loss and those kind of things. So there's no doubt that that, that has helped propel this kind of service forward. Um, but I think, you know, th- there would have, th- it's not just about 
drone thermography. I, I think there's a lot more to come from the use of robots, whether they're flying or ground-based robots in the in the in the industry, right? But the cost of this stuff has come down. So, you know, that all adds to the um, accessibility of it, the lower the price point, the more you can use this, the more frequency, frequently you can you can carry out these scans. Um, so it's all it's all going in that sort of trajectory. Yeah. So you now have a ton more data that you're collecting today, and I'm sure mm. from one flyover than you were in 2016 as well. Yeah. So, so, so I know when we were scaling, you're looking at how do we manage that scale of data infrastructure, right? Or of data yeah. that you're collecting. Uh, what granularity do you collect data? What do you do with it? Ultimately, we found that we're not doing much on some aspects of the data, but with others, we are. Uh, so how, how does that work from your kind of scaling above from a data so, perspective? Yeah, so, I mean, it's worth, yeah, one of the things that I think is really important in our journey was um, that as soon as we had cracked a way of consistently and reliably scanning modules to for a credible outcome, right? And so we devised a way of scanning. We're, we're one of the only companies that, that uses a scanning approach to the data collection rather than a mapping collection. And it means that we get the sensors closer to the module surface. But as soon as you've collected images on hundreds of thousands of solar panels, you've got to find a way of presenting that in a useful and valuable form to the client, right? So right from the beginning in 2016, um, we knew that the answer was not a spreadsheet or a PDF. We knew the answer had to be, you know, a data driven SaaS type platform to allow people to access this data readily, right? Um, and this is where like my background in IT probably came into the picture. But essentially we built on the back of that need, we built what is probably now referred to as a digital twin. And, and it was the thing that's now talked about a lot but essentially we were representing a solar asset all the way down to the smallest um, component on that, on that plant in a way to report our information. And what that led to quite quickly was we realized that people loved digesting inspection and testing and measurement data in the kind of layout context of a solar farm. And, you know, some of the other systems, SCADA systems and asset management platforms are using a nomenclature to represent things rather than a way of visually digesting. And that was the thing that really resonated with people because if you can, there are so many nuances to a solar asset layout that might answer questions. That area of the field is damp. That area of the field was built by an EPC we had to get rid of because they were so awful. That area of the field has got a different batch of modules in it. We use different cable here, whatever. So there's stuff that's relevant to the layout that, that is actually really important information when you're understanding when you've identified a problem how big is it how 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 bad is it going to get and so that visualization of a plant geospatially and then electrically um so everything you know every module understanding it belongs to that string etc cetera, etc cetera, that whole hierarchy is hugely powerful and that's why it was a logical progression for us to use our software beyond aerial tomography so electroluminescence and IV curves and riso tests and visual inspections and those kind of things, it starts to create intelligence. And going back to your question, that's, that's where the secret source lies with all of this. It's being able to coalesce that data in a way where you can start to drive out really, really intelli intelligent, predictive analytics and predictive maintenance. And that comes from big data. And it doesn't necessarily only come from the big data of the thermography. You need to augment that with other forms of data to start to really understand what's happening on your part. And I think, you know, companies like Above have got huge coverage of tens of gigawatts of, of inspection information. And you can, you can derive a lot from that big data. You can, I can tell you how long certain module types last in a certain climate, but actually when you get the depth of the other information, you can then start to, really credibly start to power those predictive things that the solar industry so desperately needs, right? One of the biggest numbers that I always use when I'm talking to clients is, is that 80% of the maintenance cost of solar is human resource. And we're now trying to roll out solar at rates never, never imagined before with a finite 
amount of human resources who know about solar. And so you've got to get really clever about how you use that, that resource that's per megawatt is dwindling because we're building out so many megawatts now that you don't have that oversight, right? So it's hugely important to the industry what we're doing, hugely. I love so it. I, I think here, the important part is I'm going to bring it down to the user experience. Yeah. So how, how do you derive insight? I think that's what interesting that you're talking about is to focus on digesting the information. And I think it's a problem not only in solar and wind uh, and renewables in general, but in a lot of other mm. industries, there's just actually too much data. Mm. There's, there's, we're not, it's not a data scarcity problem. It's a data yeah. overflow problem. More yeah. Than so, so I think that's, that's a great piece of advice there is thinking about how you visualize and use that data. Uh, and I know when we first met talking about layers of data, right? That's, yeah. uh, I think I remember yeah. our, our initial conversation. Yeah, yeah. We had part of the equation. You had another part of the equation. How do Correct. we yeah. bring it together? Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's a really important thing to think about. Yeah. Uh, you also talked about the digital twin. <laughs> which is a convoluted term, like asset management is, to be yeah. honest, right? <laughs> Everybody so, has a digital twin. Yeah. Exactly, right? I, I, here's I'm an avatar. Um, <laughs> Feels like my avatar in space. Like it's my digital <laughs> twin. So, but, but importantly, like what, what does a digital twin mean to you, Will, right? Like how yeah. would you define that? Uh, and where, where do you think those twins are going? Uh, conceptually yeah. speaking, like what's the next evolution there and what, what, what can we learn from them? Yeah, so I think the key thing with, with digital, the digital twin in Zola is, is to capture the information at the time the asset is being built. So, you know, you're not reworking stuff. So you need a, you need a kind of a solution that works with the asset right from its you know, first breaking ground, first designing after the top bow, probably at the top bow, right? So you're getting that digital rendition of the asset and then collecting all of the information in the context of the asset in a way which can be digested and used throughout its life cycle, throughout the various stages of, of construction, commissioning, pack, fac, and all the other different sort of stages in its life. Um, and that digital twin supports all of the maintenance and management and, you know, decision making that's got to be made in the life of our asset so so you know the way we look at a digital twin is being able to represent the asset in 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 digitally so you can go down to a single component and look at its metadata the attributes of that component its history of testing and measuring and commissioning its serial number that whole gambit so, right and when so you talk time about time and space is, is that a, a, a yeah. oversimplification yeah, yeah, that, that is. It, it is it is just that. And I think the industry has been really kind of held back by the subsidy fueled eras in different countries has has led to this kind of multiple parties developing, building, you know, and then you know the 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 the, uh, the destination funder. There's so many flipping of the asset through its life. And the industry was trying to do this at a break breakneck speed because it's meeting a subsidy deadline and you know having worked in any i know what those subsidy deadlines mean but i know what they mean to the quality of the asset as well right you know so there's a lot of there's always been that sort of build now fix later and i i always kind of hope that in the post subsidy era we would learn by those mistakes but i think because we know because there's so much to do now we're trying to build out so much solar and there's not enough components to go around you know it's the seller's market from a module perspective then then we there, there's a risk that we we carry on making some of those mistakes, right? But that's where each of those stages is where lots of data got lost, lots of accountability kind of just dissolved away. And I think if you can capture, you know, like the scenario I was explaining before, where if you knew that those transfer cables in that area of the site had got a whole lot of repairs done to them because they got damaged in the install, and then you see t 10 years later, RISO problems on that side of the site, you can correlate, right? You can start to say, that that relates to that history of the asset, and that would yeah. speed up resolution. It sounds like you're, bringing, huh? sounds like you're yeah. bringing a lot of history into this and yeah. bringing that, so you have context to the current state of your asset, and yeah. that that history is so important to not only save money going forward to the people mm. who are using the data, but can predict yeah. it in what it does. So, yeah. hey, we've seen these trends. Look for them in the future, and this is the that that real piece of information that's going to bring the industry to the next level. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and we've just got a bit smarter. You, you, as in you mentioned there's like we're drowning in data. But we are, but we're drowning on, in, in silos and without its kind of context. And yeah. so, you know, I, I use the Gestalt kind of principle, right? We've got enough data, we can make a lot more value out of just bringing it together properly. Um, and we could probably get rid of quite a lot, actually, if we brought the core together. You know, I would argue that, you know, an O&M obligation to go and do IV curves, you know, across 10% of the strings every X months. I don't know. I, I, I question the value on, in doing mm -hmm. th that amount of testing if you're doing drone thermography, for instance. So there's, a, there's some efficiency to be gained in some of this as well. When we bring this data together, we can probably trim things back. And still get a better outcome and lower costs in the making which mm. is paramount to the success of the industry in the future yeah uh, yeah so, so I, I think i think that's an interesting insight and I, I know i've been a big fan of standardization especially on the contract side for for a long time which it still hasn't really happened let's be honest um mm. so i think that's something that we can aspire to as well as an industry to have more standardized methodologies to drive better outcomes yeah um so, but for me, standardization, you start in one market and then you expand to others and then you realize, oh shit, things are very different in insert name of country, right? Yeah. Uh, I know you guys have expanded from your UK base to kind of cover uh, other countries there. Uh, you talked about using, I'm saying, done service providers in different jurisdictions, lower staffing costs and so on, which I think mm -hmm. is brilliant. So what, what have you learned really from that geographic expansion? How did that happen? Were you dragged by your client? You say, no, I'm going to Australia or Japan or Spain. What, what mm. was the kind of that, the driver behind that geographic expansion of above? Yeah, so it, mostly the pull was from our customers. Um, and that was sort of where we entered new markets, typically on the back of working for an international developer or asset owner. Um, and they like what we do and they would ask whether we could do it in, in, in those other countries. So yeah, our first foray, I think, I mean, it ended up across Europe and, and beyond, but, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, South America, a lot of that work initially was on the back of European customers. Um, and now we've, you know, we're building um, business development function to allow us to start to grow the domestic relationships in those markets as, as the solar industry grows. Um, so, yeah, it was, yeah, I remember... Yeah, the first foray, I think, outside of the UK was in into Italy. Um, yeah, and that was that was quite an interesting time because this was, again, it was before there was dozens of drone service providers. So this would have been, I think, late 2016 or early 17, where we started operating in the Italian market. But we also attempted and pulled it off <laughs> doing um, uh, not just the thermographic inspection, but actually... Um, inspecting for snail trails. So using visual imagery to assess the spread of, of um, micro cracks, which were now surfacing, surfacing themselves as snail trails, right? So we, we, we did an inspection for a technical advisory um, company in, the, in Europe. Um, and I think that was probably an industry first, right? Using a drone to do the, the visual inspection. So we had to do an elevation model of the terrain to get the drone closer to the module surface. Um, and yeah, it's a much more involved um, process than it would be would be today. But it was it was, you know it met a need. That I think it was a secondary market transaction we were supporting, um, and it gave a whole lot of insights that gave some commercial leverage in the right place. I think. Um, cool. But the Italian market's been interesting because the other thing about when you move into some of the older markets is you see things that are happening on the older assets right so that's been hugely useful for us as a business because we're effectively getting a window into the future into the into the newer markets um because the module technology hasn't changed significantly um in a way that means that that data isn't representative of what's going to happen in the future in fact it's been you know rather worryingly similar in how it's playing out in other markets but it's been, yeah, it's almost like getting that lens into the future, seeing how assets are aging, seeing what problems that starts to cause. And then, you know, applying that to a, to a market where those assets are start to, starting to reach that, that spot. I mean, we're seeing that in the UK market now. So, you know, assets are coming of age in the UK, um, um, you know, reminding our, our clients that they have a 10-year 
product warranty on their modules that they might be might want to be mindful of um yeah. and so yeah it's it's been useful cool cool and and i love the idea that you talked about how emerging into different markets and developing new things and and when you started there was there wasn't a lot of drone providers but now mm -hmm. it seems like there's a ton of them everywhere and mm -hmm. and they're growing and there's tons of things but how is the innovation like you've seen in italy helped really drive you and keep you at the front of the list uh, and, and the front of the line here? Well, we, you know, so our whole business is about sort of driving the cost of solar down, right? So if we can, if, if we can help the solar industry deploy quicker and decarbonize energy quicker, that's what, that's what the business is, is here to do. And we're doing that through the use of technology. And, and, you know, I, I remember when I first joined the industry um, back in 2014, thinking, jeepers, they're still using spreadsheets for these huge plants. And they're, you know, they're trying to track condition of things. And it was quite su surprising how, how backward the use of technology was. And it was a very new market, right? So, um, but it, it was a huge opportunity. And that, and that is still a very, you know, real opportunity for the industry. Because, you know, like I said, we're now trying to grow even quicker as an industry. And therefore, people revert to defaults, right? They, they start to pick up the spreadsheets again. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we know that the, the use of a flying robot can play a bigger and bigger part in the solar industry. Um, I'm, all for, I'm all for using drones for the right applications. Um, and I think inspecting solar, solar panels is a perfect application for the drone. Um, uh, uh, I'm probably a little bit more skeptical where I see drones being used to carry water around and try and clean panels. Um, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of defying gravity for the sake of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the innovation, we want to just get more and more value in terms of credible data, credible imagery from, from these drone inspections. And the technology is moving so quickly, I think, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve massively over the next few years. Yeah, so, so, so I'll dissect what you've said there. I think there's two things to kind of take away. Yeah. One is that uh, you're learning from other markets and that has application across the different markets, which I think, mm -hmm. I think is great. It's, it's something that we tend to forget when we try to copy paste or we're doing at home in a new market. There's also things that we can learn in the new market that we can bring back home. So I think that yeah. I think you're touching on that. Uh, and, and also the conditions are, are different everywhere, right? So... Uh, having that flexibility in your setup to deliver, as you said, a different service in a new market. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a challenge for anyone. Uh, so kudos on you guys to kind of pushing that forward. Um, and then the, the really interesting thing is like, uh, that's enabled you to grow faster, I guess, to some extent. Mm. So what are the challenges that you've seen now? Okay, so you're working in different markets, you're working with your own employees, of drone service providers, different types of inspections. How do you manage that growth and how, how do you manage to keep going fast? Yeah, so so I guess if you take it from the sort of, the, the software the software side of things is kind of the easier bit because I, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an easier thing from a, from a scaling perspective. Shh, don't tell anybody, but, they'll all do it. But, but I guess what, what, what happens with the software side of things is your clients become more demanding because they can start they start to get it so it starts to mature and they start to understand and they want a little bit more and they want something different so holding the line on a on a software roadmap um, <laughs> is is it is one of the challenges with that side of it but just the the sheer logistics of um doing our data you know the data collection the operational side of the business i guess is 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 a challenge so language you know language support so you know we've We've got people upstairs who can speak in all the European languages we need. Um, and that's quite important when you're talking to an O&M engineer on a site in Sicily or somewhere and a drone service provider. Um, so, you know, that, that sort of language support as we grow and we're now operating in, in, in Southeast Asia. And so, so that, that's, that's definitely a challenge for us because we're growing with physical sort of albeit subcontracted, but physical presence in those markets where that language support, you know, it's that think global, operate local mindset is, is really important. Um, 
so yeah that, that's one of the challenges and then the the, the age-old challenge with with doing thermography as any of our competitors will, will be aware of is 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 weather right fickle weather um and i think you know in northern europe um where we've really cut our teeth is how do you manage the the the, the pipeline of work when you've got a whole dimension that's outside of your control you know, it's the weather um you know last year in northern europe there was it was it was a very wet and changeable august and that made the whole delivery side of that that service line incredibly challenging this year it's been wall to wall sunshine so it's it's made a big difference to what what august looks like so scaling up and handling those kind of real things in in the locale is probably the hardest bit and i also come from a software background so that that's um it's more sort of i've got more experience in in making that happen than making drone service providers operate in um you know indonesia or thailand or chile or whatever right so <laughs> it's it's hard it's hard work there's, there's we're dealing with physical people then in physical things doing physical things yeah, and businesses are much easier without clients or employees. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but they don't exist, right? Uh, <laughs> but I think you said something very important about scaling. It's about learning how to say no. And no is yeah. a super yeah. powerful word that mm. collectively, especially startups, we don't use enough. Oh, 100%. Uh, because usually you go through a phase where you say yes to everything. Yeah. Uh, and that gets you to a point where you're in trouble. Yeah. And you're like, okay, from this point forward, we have to stop saying yes to everything. <laughs> and you need to say, say no. Yeah. And it's super challenging, right? But as yeah. a founder, and you go there and you, you're sitting down with a big IPP or a big asset manager, and they tell you, well, buy your product if you have this. And yeah. I, you, I go back to, the, to your product team and say, hey, guys, we should build this. And like, but that's not yeah. the robot. That's not what we're working on right now. It's all, yeah. And it's like really matching that balance. I so can't I'm super remember. Happy that you're, I can't remember how many times that I said, what did you promise them, Etienne? Yeah. <laughs> Kicking days. him under the table. No, I, I yeah, that, that really resonates. But I think, um, I think uh, because it's slightly different with our software platform in that the actual service, you know, the, the, the services that they support are so novel that there's not high expectations in terms of comparing you to the other system, right? And so we're kind of cutting new new services in, in, in the industry. So things like, um, you know, one of, one, of my, one of our best solutions, which is the lowest technical kind of um, challenge was serial number scanning, right? You know, th this was, this was um, a service that the industry had just really struggled with being able to do serial number scanning accurately. And when I say accurately, if you haven't got the location of the serial, mod, uh, serial number in the module, then it's kind of just bin stuff, right? So <laughs> you've got to have that information. And having that reliably collected and documented was fraught with problems, right? Because it usually gets given to someone who doesn't really necessarily give a monkeys about the quality of what they're doing as long as they've recorded the data. And also the downstream usage of that data weren't, weren't really understood. But it's only now where people are going, well, hang on. Every time I try and do a warranty claim or try and work out the exposure to a particular batch problem, I've got to know where these modules are. And I've got to report the serial numbers of these modules. And it also was in the Italian market where the, 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 the uh, regulators insisted that if they couldn't evidence you know, all the serial numbers of the asset that was commissioned, then there was a risk that the subsidy was removed. So there became a, a pressing business need to do it in Italy for a period of time. But wow. essentially... The app that we developed, you know, when you look at the AI and the computer vision and the drone and all the other clever stuff we're doing, the app that we've developed just enforces locational accuracy and collects a serial number in a, in a, you know, a, rapid, a rapid way. Um, it's only a one-off activity. Once you've done that for your park and providing you maintain that information, then it's hugely powerful. But it's really low-tech low solution for a really valuable um, problem to be solved. Um, so, I, yeah, really like that one. And I really like the fact that we're now getting traction. I think one of the interesting things is when you've got a, an asset owner who's got a portfolio of assets, and now most of them have got aging assets in their portfolio, 
And that's when you've got the burning platform to have these conversations where you can say, mm-hmm. that's why you need this, right? Don't wait till the, pla- the platform is burnt down. You know, get on the front foot, record all this information at the beginning because you will need it. You just don't know you need it yet. And it's only when they get an example of an asset where it becomes distressed that the, the conversation becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Well, sometimes the simplest think, solutions are the best solutions, right? Yeah. Low, low tech, high impact. I remember being in the field scanning modules yeah. uh, in a previous business for <laughs> QA purposes. Um, yeah. Did you care where you were scanning? Uh, for the for, for 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 what we were doing, we didn't care. We were doing sa- random sampling to make sure that right. the modules that were declared to be on site were actually on site. Yeah. Uh, so we're yeah. doing random testing of modules, and then we're yeah being, and testing out different apps on my phone and scanners to to mm. ease data collection for my team. Mm. Uh, mm. And I remember that as being a, a particularly enjoyable experience. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, Will, I, I think we're, we're heading uh, about time. So I love the low tech, high impact, learning from markets, uh, going yeah. fast and leveraging the ecosystem that you've talked about. Uh, thank you so much uh, for kind of joining the call today. I, I've had a great yeah. time uh, sharing and learning uh, from the journey at, uh, at Above. Uh, I'm just going to call it that, not Above Survey. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Your own brand. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm on that. Okay, thank you. So, so thank you so much for saying yes uh, to this and telling our viewers how to learn how to say no. Uh, yeah. So I think that's super helpful. Well, Excellent. thank you very much for having me along. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's been a great, it's been a great talking about your journey. Bye.